two weeks. So it'll be the first Sunday in December that those will be due. All right, as you can see, November the 29th will be the first Sunday of Advent. And we'll be hanging the greens and decorating the church for Christmas after our worship service. Uh, any other announcements before we do birthdays? Anna? <coughs> this is an announcement plus a joy. Last Sunday we had 10 children in the preschool Sunday school class. Did you see me fly? Vic, I hollered at Vic, come and help me. <laughs> and Jamie is wonderful. But anyway, we're going to have a Christmas program. It's going to be on the 13th, yet decided as to what time. Uh, we're going to have a, a real baby. I'm real excited about that. A Mary and Joseph and baby. I think the little children will like that. So keep that in mind on the 13th. Thank you. Okay, a couple more announcements that I forgot about. Um, on the Green Flyer, our church is hosting the um, Thanksgiving service, which is November the 26th. Uh, worship time is at 7, but there, we're going to have a reception before that uh, with cookies and coffee. And so I'm sure if you would like to bring cookies, that would be great. Second thing is... Casey Cornwell had a baby boy on Thursday, and his name is Finn. Do you know how much he weighed, Jen? Eight, six. Eight pounds, six ounces, okay? Baby boy, Casey Cornwell, whatever her name is now. <laughs> okay? All right. Um, it looks like birthdays today. I don't see Amy. Uh, I don't know if you're either. I do want to add on um, okay. Grace Renault. Today she is 90. All right. And they are pushing a card shower. So if you know Grace, send her a card. Okay. And she also had surgery on her leg this week, but I think she's doing okay. Okay, so today is Grace Renault's birthday. She is 90. So if you could send her a card, they're trying to have a card shower for her, and she's out here at Kendall. She's at home. Oh, she is. She's still at home. Okay. And Amy's anything right else? Over here. Amy's what? Right over here. Oh, there's Amy. Oh, Amy. Hi. Okay. Well, let's sing Happy Birthday to Amy then. You ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you.
Come, holy people. Jesus Christ has made us holy. Come, holy people. God's Spirit joins us in this holy time. Come, holy people. God's holy house is open to everyone. Concerned about what happened in Paris, much more lives. That is certainly something that could happen to any country in the world. Concerns about Paris. We have some dear friends who are missionaries in Paris right now, and uh, they were in their home 
and uh, we're mm. playing games with people who spoke four different languages. Uh, their ministry is to Muslim people in, in, in Paris. And so they're right in the thick of this entire thing. So uh, we need to keep, keep Paris in prayer. Anything else? Amy? I'd like to ask for continued prayers for my great grandson and writer. He goes to the uh, Mercy Clinic in Wichita to the cardiologist to see if the two whole things will part or mend me. And he now has a physical therapist that comes weekly to my house to help him with therapy. And he seems to be responding very well to that. Thank you for your prayers and love. That prayer request was for Ryder. Father, this morning we uh, are grateful for the opportunity to come and worship you. And Lord, we come from all kinds of different places and situations, our family circumstances, job circumstances. We're affected by the positive and negative attitudes of the people that we work with. The physical health of family members, and Lord, uh, help us to just this moment take a deep breath and let it out, and rest in you. What a gift it is to know that you hold everything, all of that stuff in your hands. And Lord, when these things become concerns for us, we can lay them down at your feet. So we ask, Lord, that you help us to come to your cross open-handed and lay those things down. Lord, you desire that we live in joy and victory from faith to faith, rather from, than from crisis to crisis. And so we ask, Lord, help our unbelief, strengthen our faith, fill us with your spirit of joy and peace. Lord, this morning we are mindful of, of uh, the goings-on around the world. difficulty of non-Muslim people trying to help all those uh, refugees from Syria and other places and yet falling victim to some very wicked people. And so Lord we ask that you would help those in Paris who are grieving the loss of loved ones. In fact, those around the world, that was, uh, there were many international people who were present and, uh, and were killed there. We ask, Lord, that, um, that you would find a way to help your, um, your Christian children around the world find ways to love those who are hurting to help those who are in need and to bring glory to your name. Father, we are, are joyful with Jim, uh, who was able to spend time with his son and who is enjoying the services at the care home. We ask, Lord, that, uh, that you would um, continue to use us as ministers in the community to serve 
uh, the, the care homes in this community. And we ask, Lord, uh, or we want to say, Lord, thank you for the, the, uh, the attendance in Sunday school last week. And uh, we ask that you bless those children that have come. We pray that we'll have many more opportunities to serve them um, and offer them the grace of Christ. Lord, we, we are joyful with Grace Renault and her 90th birthday celebration. And we ask, Lord, that um, you would make her well aware of your presence with her. Thank you for Amy as well. And uh, ask especially for her family that, um, that you would help them as they um, are deeply concerned about the health of Ryder. And, and ask, Lord, that you would um, give the doctors wisdom as they offer treatment therapy uh, for him. We ask, Lord, that you would, you would guide them as they raise him. We praise the Lord that Faraline has been able to come home, and we know that um, she is likely very full of joy today. And uh, for those others on our um, on our prayer list, we ask that you would minister to them today, fill them with peace and love and joy. And now, would you join me as we pray? As our Father taught us, as our Lord taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you turn in, to, in your worship uh, hymnals to number 140? Great is thy faith. <laughs>
11 through 14 and 19 through 25. And every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Thanks be to God. I want to start this morning with our application points. Three simple ideas. Press in to God with boldness. In other words, draw near to God. Profess without wavering. Speak out boldly the faith. And third, provoke each other to love and good deeds. To stir one another up. To not allow each other to become complacent um, or fall asleep spiritually, but keep stirring one another up and encouraging one another, provoking each other to love and good deeds. So press in, profess, and provoke. Lord, as I open your word this morning and proclaim it, I ask that these would be your words. I give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. In every batch of Christian people, there are those who struggle to hold on without wavering. Some waver in and out of church. Um, things become more important than worshiping God. Their greater loyalties lie outside the church. Uh, people inside the church who do not behave in a Christ-like manner discourage some people from coming to church. They have said them. There, there, there are hurtful words that are sometimes said, intentionally or unintentionally. Sometimes uh, when decide, making decisions in the church, there are color of the carpet kind of issues that come up. Well, I'd like it to be red, or I'd like it to be blue. And they start, no one wants to, uh, to give up their color the carpet, if you will. That can destroy relationships and cause people to waver in and out of church. So, um, And then some come to church mainly to pay back the church for helping with a personal need. And when they feel like that the, the debt has been paid back by their attendance, then they disappear for a while until they've been helped again. And then they come back to church. Some waver in their belief that Jesus' blood completely saves. They've been taught for many years that there is no assurance of salvation, that it can't be had. Uh, they've been taught for many years that God's judgment is more powerful than His grace. 
They've been taught for many years that there is a threshold of bad behavior in which God says, okay, that's too much. You aren't worth saving anymore. I can't save you, and even if I could, I wouldn't save you. Some waver in their belief that Jesus' blood completely saved. Some waver in their belief that God loves them. Can God really love a sinner like me? <coughs> Some way to waver in their trust that God keeps his promises. Nobody else keeps their promises. How can I trust in a God that made these people? He must not keep his promises either. Some waver in their belief of God's grace in general. That they waver in the idea or believing the idea that grace is where God steps in. And does what we cannot do. <coughs> Tell you a story about Marion. Helpless, alone, without hope, and overwhelmed by guilt, Marion turns to God. In trying to find God, Marion begins attending church. She thinks that finding God means that she has to be good or stop sinning and, and then go to church regularly. But Marion doesn't find God at all. She just finds church. A religious expression. She makes movements or progress only by her own effort, cleaning up her act, changing her own life by her willpower, and trying to become a good person. And it isn't working. Every time she becomes too hungry, too angry, too lonely or tired, she reverts back to her sinful patterns. Nothing has really changed. Now, since nothing really has changed, Marion's desperation and panic have multiplied. Marion is like a half-dead person trying to shock herself back to life with a defib... Def now I can say that word. Defibrillator. Thank you very much. <laughs> but that's not how God works. See, God doesn't depend on our willpower and commitment to transform a hopeless life, a hopeless situation. He can raise people from the dead and create new life where there is none. If Marion were finding God, or if God were finding her, then she would have found some kind of help, strength, and presence beyond her own efforts. Maybe uh, some of you can relate to Marion this morning. Maybe you're, but maybe you're sitting there thinking, you know, look, Pastor, I'm just a normal person. I, I have, I have, sure, I have normal kinds of life stresses and and problems like everybody else, but I'm not in a big life crisis like one of those people. Maybe you waver on whether or not God is of any use for someone with no real problems. Because you haven't lost your way. But I would say, please be careful, because pride can be very deceptive. Most of the wavering experiences we have here within the Christian faith today have their foundation in a, distort, a distortion of Christianity. It's not the real thing. The, the, the book of Hebrews, though, lays out before us the real thing. And so here, turning to the text, we find the, in, a, in a nutshell, right here, in these few verses that were just read, the secret to Christian living. Yes, a secret to Christian living. This secret is to first discern from the Bible what God has done in our behalf. And secondly, then respond as the scriptures call and invite or command us to respond. 
So, if I can say it this way, the secret to Christian living is discovering what God has provided for us, God's provision, and then in our response, what our privilege is and how we can respond. And we see it in these words in the text today. We see several places where it says, we have, we have, we possess, we have been given. Okay? So on that side of the, the equation, we have God's provision. What God has given to us for anything that we have, that we possess, that is good, is from God. And on the other side of the, equa the equation, we have our privilege. And that comes through in the text as, let us, dot, dot, dot. So, because we have, let us do this. Let us be this. So God's provision establishes our privilege as recipients of that provision. So first, the we haves. In the scripture, in verse 18, um, it is described, and maybe not so much in these words, but certainly we can see here that we have forgiveness of sin. In verse 18. In verse 19, we have confidence to pass through the veil or the curtain into the most holy place, the place where God dwells. Uh, through Christ, Christ's body became uh, a, the curtain. And as when he was um, uh, killed on the cross, the curtain, there was a great earthquake. Uh, and it tore, that earthquake tore the veil between the holy place and the most holy place in two. It opened up that curtain. And in a, that is a sign to tell us what Jesus did for us in relationship to God. God parted the curtain. What was the curtain? The curtain was our sin. The curtain was the law of God that could only show us what our sin was, could not uh, save us or deal with our sin. So, we have confidence to pass right through the veil to the throne room of God and we can worship Him there face to face through Christ. And that's verse 19. In verse 21, we have a great priest over the house of God who is Christ, Jesus. And in uh, as a part of that, what that, pre that great priest has done is he has cleansed our hearts. So we have clean hearts. Uh, who, spring who sprinkles, Jesus sprinkles our hearts with his blood. Our guilty, con the most important part of that is that our guilty consciences have been wiped out. We no longer approach God's throne in fear because... Our conscience has been just, uh, dealt with. We also have, and this is the last of the we haves of the God's provision, we have clean bodies. Jesus washes our bodies with pure water. It's a reference to the promised resurrection and eternal life. That these bodies, though they are dead, yet shall they live. The valley of dry bones will be raised. Flesh will be put on those dry bones. And breath will be put in the, into the lungs of those dry bones. So we have been given clean hearts and clean bodies. So the response or our privilege out of that, those truths, is this. In verse 22 we see that we can continue drawing near to God. That's a privilege that we have. And we can come with a sincere heart. We don't have to um, disguise ourselves and cover up any sin that we have. We can come freely. And we can come in full assurance of faith. In verse 23, we see that uh, our privilege is to hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. Our hope isn't empty. It's not a wishful thinking kind of hope. It's a hope that is grounded in faith. Faith that can be 
held on to because it's in something that is absolutely true. So we can hold unswervingly. And the, the idea here is this is, uh, it's, it's just not that we just, we just grasp onto this, this faith uh, when we want to. The hold unswervingly is a continual thing. We never can let go. We never need to let go. There's nothing else to grasp but this. And then uh, just understanding that we can hold unswervingly to this hope because God keeps His promises. For He who promised is faithful. So let us continue drawing near to God. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. And then let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Verse 24. Continue. Again, this has this idea of continuing. Um, it's, a, it's a participle. It's, it's uh, to, uh, something that continues on. Continue thinking it through and devising plans how we may spur one another on uh, and uh, toward love and good deeds. Consider uh, or continually think it through and devise plans of how we, of what good deeds we can do. Think about what the needs are in our community and what good deeds can we do. So we have this privilege that, that we can continue to consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And then we have this privilege as well. Let us encourage one another all the more. It increases as time goes by, as we grow in the faith, as we uh, move from, from infants in Christ to uh, go on to maturity or perfection in Christ, we um, can, uh, that, that encouragement increases. Then uh, there's this little piece um, right there at the end, and I want to I want to go right to it because I want to make sure I get this right. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. And this word. Give up meeting together. That word give up actually means to permanently desert the church. To continue forsaking our privilege to meet and worship and fellowship together. This is our privilege to not give up. The world and all of its troubles... Uh, there is a lot of giving up. And some of it has affected even our families. We give up on marriages sometimes. We give up on our children. Some of our children give up on their parents. Brothers give up on sisters, sisters, brothers. Partners in, in business give up on each other. There's a lot of giving up in this world. But here, in the church, through the provision that God has given us, we have the opportunity to forsake giving up. We have the privilege to meet together, to worship together, and fellowship together. So, by way of application, God's provision creates our privilege we can press into God with boldness. We can move toward the front. Have you ever been to a concert? Or um, we we watched August Rush the other night. It's one of our family favorites. It's a movie, and uh, it, it's a, a movie about a young boy who simply. And I'm just going to say this real quick. He he believes that if he follows the music, he will find his parents. He's in, he's he's been left in a boy's home. And if he follows the music, he'll find his parents. And so he, he follows the music. Wherever he hears music, he follows this music. 
And his parents happened to be musicians too, but they gave up on their music. See? But at one point they grabbed a hold of their music again, and as they did, they found that their son was there waiting for them. And as they heard this music, they were drawn to it, as though there was something of themselves in this music. And here their son was conducting this orchestra at the age of 11 years old, something like that. He's conducting this, this Juilliard uh, orchestra, and here they find each other as they come together to search, uh, to find their child as they follow the music. They press through the crowd, and lots of various uh, uh, obstacles along the way to get to that final place where they came into contact with their child in a similar way. That's what pressing into God means. There, uh, we hear from God in many different ways today as believers. There are voices where God speaks through to us all over. And if we uh, follow those voices, we test them with Scripture and we follow that, those voices, we're in a sense pressing into God and we do it all the more as the craziness in this world continues to escalate. So press in with boldness. Don't be afraid to push toward God because our consciences have been freed from guilt. Then profess without wavering. Hope in God's promises. God is faithful. He keeps His promises. And therefore, we can respond to His promises with confidence and boldness. That what we are experiencing, what we are learning in the Scriptures, we can share with those people around us. We need not fear. And then we can, finally, the third piece of our application is to provoke each other to love and good deeds. Encourage one another to live in the privilege to love and live compassionately toward the people around you. It is our privilege not to backbite each other, to be respectful, um, to not have to claw our way to the top. It is our privilege to lose our life for Christ's sake. That all those selfish things that we want to uh, uh, do in our life, we can let those go and we're set free to lose our life for Christ's sake. And then we can stand on God's promises that salvation is what He did and so we can love knowing the eternal reward that He secured on our behalf. Lord, these words are, um, are powerful, this, this book of Hebrews, and, and there's so much depth to it, and uh, we, we are so grateful that you cared enough about us to not leave us where, where we're at, but continue to, to spur us on toward love and good deeds. We ask, Lord, that you would guide us in our, in our day, in our work week, and we, uh, in our family. And we ask that you use our lives to bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray.
found on page 374, Standing on the Mountains. <laughs> Go in peace as holy people, in Jesus' name, amen.